Professor Akihiko Tanaka, President of GRIPS in Japan, distinguished panelists, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Good day to all of you and welcome to this GRIPS RSIS workshop on regional economic integration in the post-pandemic era. First and foremost, I would like to thank GRIPS for initiating this collaboration on this particularly timely topic. As we always say here in RSIS, regional economic integration is a topic that never goes out of style. For good reason. Strengthening trade and investment linkages across the region is one path towards diversifying our respective economies and boosting economic growth for ourselves our respective country, that is, as well as the region and globally. We look at one particular data point from the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, or in short, UNSCAP. UNSCAP has projected a lower regional GDP growth for 2022. They are forecasting 4.9% due to reduced consumption and export demand. In some school of thoughts, meanwhile, yeah, enmeshing allies and non-allies alike in trade and investment networks contribute to peace via interdependence. So there are various ideas and suggestions out there in the marketplace to integrate our respective economies. Regional economic integration is important against the slowdown in what is happening at the WTO, World Trade Organization. WTO is struggling to update its own rule book. Regional trade agreements and forums therefore provide a mean to fill in the gap or the slowdown at the WTO and hopefully our regional trade arrangements will allow us to try out new things which can subsequently be applied under the WTO framework. Boostering regional economic integration has not been without challenges, particularly in recent years. You have seen the global COVID-19 pandemic, supply chain have been disrupted, and these have also exacerbated the protectionist sentiments we see in different countries. Trade is trickier with the pandemic-induced barriers to the movement of people, trade in goods and services. Consequently, rulemaking has been delayed and there are various ways in which countries around the world try to make up for the disruption caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Yet, all these things about Zoom diplomacy, online discussion, cannot replace the need for in-person interaction. The Asia-Pacific, or some people call it the Indo-Pacific, has also become a more complex and uncertain environment not only for trade, but for a variety of interstate activities. Tension between the United States and China has given rise to a lot of other developments. And with the COVID-19 disrupting supply chain and creating uncertainty for the business sector, we are indeed in a very difficult moment for the regional economic integration. But nevertheless, we have to continue. Trade is important to all of us. And over the past few decades, the benefit of interdependence have been obvious to all the countries in our region. Notwithstanding the big powers struggling to uh, take advantage of each other's strength and lobby for more uh, advantages for each of their own uh, economies. 
There are several important questions. What is the likely trajectory of US, Singapore, China relations? How these relations can be affecting US, China ties, as well as US, China relations with countries like Japan and other important countries in the region. How would the regional economic order be going forward? What are the rules, features and logic? What role do the existing regional arrangements such as the RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, as well as the CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership play in moving our economic integration forward. Bear in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that these agreements are what we call life agreements. They are subject to revision with the changing of times and membership. Question therefore is how do they get updated and what inspiration can we pick up from other experiences by smaller and more focused what we call mini-lateral diplomacy and discussions. In particular, we have this particular development called the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, DIPA. We all appreciate that we are now in a digital era and everything we do revolve around the digital systems and digital platforms. So what can DIPA or the negotiation for DIPA tell us and prepare us for the broader regional economic integration. Then in recent days, we are also talking about the addition or absence of certain countries to our regional trading arrangements. The UK is a good example. It has left the EU and it is active in our region, Southeast Asia in particular. So, what are the prospects of those existing agreements we have now contributing to a broader involvement by other newer members or countries outside our region? To make matter worse, most of these countries interested in our region, our region's economic growth, and future economic benefits, they don't see eye to eye on many other big interstate relations. So all these issues will complicate our economic rule making, our trade arrangements with one another, and the tendency is to let the existing barriers or more obstacles be thrown into the marketplace in order to maintain the respective advantages that some of the countries in the region would like to have for themselves. So, a big question for this uh, session that we are having today is really whether the RCEP and the CPTPP, are they an insurance policy to sustain us on the path for economic integration? And if not, what other things we have to do to make sure that all these big regional free trade agreements will help to sustain the regional economic integration that all our respective governments have embarked on in the past few decades. I will stop here, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I look forward to a fruitful discussion today and learn from all your wise ideas and uh, exchanges. Thank you very much for your attention. His Excellency, Ambassador Ong Ken Yong, Executive Director, Chairman, S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, RSIS. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor and privilege for me to welcome researchers and experts from all over the world 
to the GRIPS RSIS workshop. GRIPS is collaborating with RSIS to promote various intellectual exchange activities, such as joint uh, research and webinars like this. In September 2019, GRIPS, together with RSIS and CSIS of Indonesia, launched the Policy Research Network of Contemporary Southeast Asia, PRNC. This network has been conducting joint research in uh, various areas, including great power rivalry and maritime order and sustainable economic growth. In this endeavor, RSIS has played a leading role uh, in the joint research, including hosting the inaugural meeting of PR and uh, SEA in Singapore. RSIS has also co-chaired more than 10 CSIS GRIPS RSIS webinars under the PRNC uh, framework and has been engaged in fruitful discussions with uh, universities and research institutes in ASEAN and ASEAN dialogue partners on the changing strategic and economic order in Asia and the way forward for the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. Today, I'm extremely pleased that GRIPS and RSIS are jointly organizing an international workshop on regional economic integration in the post-pandemic era by inviting researchers and experts across the regions. Since the 1980s, East Asia, especially ASEAN, has seen the expansion of industrial supply changes as a result of the growth of foreign direct investment. And de facto regional economic integration has proceeded uh, in the region. Since the 1990s, the networking of FDAs, such as AFTA, ASEAN Plus One FDA, uh, RCEP, and CPTPP has progressed, and de jure uh, regional economic integration has boosted de facto regional economic integration. In the midst of geopolitical tectonic shifts uh, in Asia, uh, particularly with the coming of the tensions between China and the United States, and uh, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. I think it is necessary to promote the formation of high quality rules through various trade frameworks, such as RCEP, CPTPP, and WTO, in order to stabilize the economic order in the region. We are now entering a new phase of regional economic integration such as the entry into force of the RCEP and the request of China and Taiwan to join the CPTPP. We are faced with a major issue, that is how to promote regional economic integration in Asia in order to improve the quality of mega FTAs and expand their membership. In addition, supply chains especially in Asia, are greatly affected not only by the US-China rivalry, but also by various other factors such as natural disasters, pandemics, green growth, and human rights. Under these circumstances, how to build a trustworthy supply chain by using digital technology and in collaboration with like-minded countries will be a challenge for governments and industries in the future. As the program indicates, today we are discussing, one, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the US-China strategic competition on the regional economic order, two, the direction of regional economic integration in Asia beyond RCEP and CPTPP, and three, strengthening supply chain resilience. With the participations of excellent panelists, I'm sure that we are able to have constructive and insightful discussion, which I hope could lead to useful policy recommendations that can be reported to the Intergovernmental Track 1 Forum in the future. In conclusion, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Ambassador Aung Ken Yong and all those involved in organizing this workshop, as well as to researchers and experts who will present in uh, the sessions today.
with this, I'll uh, stop my opening remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm giving you a warm welcome you know, to the very first session of the GRIPS RSIS workshop on regional economic integration in the post-pandemic era. Um, I'd like to share with you that the first session will be devoted to three different but uh, closely related questions. So the first, we are going to think about how the uh, global pandemic and the uh, rivalry between the US and China has affected you know, economic cooperation so far. And then secondly, how do uh, uh, multiple responses of you know, governments to this uh, major event um, shape the uh, regional economic order? And then the last question we'd like to explore is you know, what regional trade or economic cooperation uh, will look like in a pandemic or, or, or in a post-pandemic era? So today uh, we, we have you know, three great speakers, you know, who will share their thoughts and views, you know, with the audience on these issues, you know, from the perspectives of the U.S., China, and the same respectively. So uh, I'd like to say that, you know, while listening to um, their presentations, you know, um, you can submit your questions, you know, using a, a chat box, you know, at the uh, bottom of the you know, uh, Zoom platform. So. Without any further ado, I would like to invite in our first speaker, Dr. Urchin Park. She is a Fong Global Fellow at the Princeton Institute for International and Regional Studies at Princeton University in the United States. Dr. Park, over to you. Thank you, and thank you to RSIS and uh, GRIPS for extending an invitation to uh, discuss this very important topic. Uh, I'm a political economist by training and uh, I have been asked to provide some of the American or US views on this issue, but at the same time, uh, what I'd like to throw out to the rest of the audience is basically a political economist view on all of the questions that were given to me in order to address these issues. And then I will append some of the US views in relation to the topics that we were supposed to uh, address as panelists. So on the first question of how, what, how and whether the COVID-19 pandemic and the US-China strategic competition um, uh, have evolved or how the pandemic has actually influenced uh, the strategic competition, there are four things to consider. Number one is that economic cooperation has been hindered or exacerbated uh, compared to pre-pandemic levels, and that multilateralism has failed immensely, especially on PPEs during uh, the first stage, first year of the pandemic, and also on vaccine distribution. And secondly, chip shortage, uh, global chip shortage that has happened. Uh, from the second year of the pandemic has exacerbated this tension as the global economy is headed towards more of a digital kind of a, a platform, digital and contactless form. And this transition, the thirdly, this transition will make the use of data in our global economy the most pivotal element. And fourthly, multilateralism will certainly not be the main point of um, global interest mobilization, perhaps in the, in the mode of regional collaboration or bilateral collaboration, this would be the norm, but single undertaking forms at the WTO, this is not going to be our main uh, mode of collaboration into the next years. So if you add a little bit of U.S. perspective here uh, on global supply chains, uh, let me point to um, semiconductors for the most part, so chips for the most part. The U.S. is determined to um, overcome the crisis that's compounded by geopolitics and the chip crunch. Um, whether the CHIPS Act that has been passed would be enough would be questionable because uh, this is not just a matter of creating more fabs in the United States, but it's more of a strategic rivalry plus, plus technological rivalry. Who gets to uh, have the upper hand as technology further progresses um, into the coming years? And 
it's not just about fabrication capacity, but it's also about how uh, companies are able to retain that technological leadership. So there's a question there for the U.S. side. But looking at Intel's moves, it's very, very clear that the U.S. is determined to utilize all interests, both private and public uh, mobilized interests, in order to uh, sustain leadership because the U.S. has invented semiconductors and wants to be in the lead. Second, so on the question of how do governments' responses to these events shape the regional economic order? There are also four things to consider. And one thing uh, for the critical um, assessment, the existing trade rules thus far and the shifting global order, the existing rules that Ambassador uh, Ong Kyung-yong has mentioned at the WTO, based upon, uh, established based upon the Marrakesh Agreement in 1995, they were written with a very wide discretion of states to use national security to protect trade. Um, it worked fine until uh, there were rivalries and national security interests embedded. Um, most of the economies in the existing trade order, they were friends or allies or they were not adversaries at least, and inclusion of China and Russia into the system have further complicated this issue. Uh, and whether they were allies or small markets, it didn't really matter much as, well, as long as there was leadership in um, this structure, which was the US or uh, transatlantic partnership. But uh, now there is plenty of reason to use the national security clause, which is my second point, Export controls are becoming a policy tool. Uh, it's not just about PPE masks during COVID-19, but geopolitical tensions give valid reasons for countries to utilize and activate export controls. So say for, in for instance, the Huawei ban or the entity list or Japan's export controls on South Korea based on South Korean Supreme Court decision to uh, uh, confiscate cash or confiscate funds from Japanese companies that com committed crimes during the Second World War. So th those kinds of things, and, and then back, uh, backlash um, attack on the South Korean industry, semiconductor industry. These are all, um, these are events that occur because export controls are now legitimized. And that now the international economic system faces this biggest rivalry uh, on security dimensions. And these are compounding the deep economic connections because economic interdependence was the main um, anchor. And now it's being weaponized in order to uh, support national security interest. And thirdly, on this second topic, existing trade rules are also being challenged because they are being outdated. Uh, in, in terms of our economy today. So it is not designed to cope with the next generation innovation, database to digital economy, and the public sector is being outplayed by the private sector in this regard, playing catch up. Governments are seeking to harness big tech because they want to see control. Uh, and you can see this in China as well as the US. And fourthly on this topic, second topic, more, com more complications are expected if and when central banks decide to issue legal digital currencies uh, in order to stand up to cryptocurrencies and stable coins in decentralized finance. To protect central bank in independence and monetary policy discretion, uh, in other words, central fi centralized finance. And here, another US take, US perspective would be that uh, the U.S. still believes in the dollar dominance in the global economy, but increasingly there are skeptics within the U.S. Um, apparatus on this issue as well, because what if there is a transition? What if there is a transition in leadership in digital finance? That's the looming question. And lastly, for the third uh, question, what would a post-pandemic vision of regional trade or economic cooperation look like? There are four dimensions to this as well. Number one, um, grouping at the like-minded regional levels is going to be the norm, and like-mindedness is going to be very arbitrary, but it leaves questions open for trade with China. 
And the second component is that data would be at the frontier of every uh, agreement that is being written or stricken between countries and even in the group uh, orders. So uh, I, I, I am pretty sure that Professor Gao will touch upon this issue. And number three, reliance on regional trade or economic cooperation will be conditional based primarily on very, very strict mutual interest encompassing national security interest. And then lastly, Splinternet or more a target form of the Chinese economy may be perceived, but not a complete decoupling in the industrial sense because there is US interest embedded for US industries. But once Chinese domestic firms get to a certain level, they will end partnerships and companies should brace for that. So I'll end it there. Okay, um, thank you very much, Dr. Park. Um, so now uh, I'd like to invite you know, our second speaker, uh, uh, Professor Henry Gao. Um, he's a professor at the uh, Yongpong House School of Law, Singapore Management University. And he is also a senior fellow at Center for International Governance and Innovation. Um, professor Gao, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh... Professor Lee, uh, now I want to start by thanking Ambassador Ang uh, and uh, Professor Tanaka for kindly inviting me. I prepared a, a short slide, so let me just bring up the uh, slide first. Okay. I hope you uh, you all can see the slide. Okay. So um, uh, it's, uh, I think this uh, conference has held a great timing. There has been many factors of driving regional economic uh, integration in the Asia Pacific in the past two decades. But over the past decade, I would argue that the main driving force has been the strategic competition between uh, the US and China. So uh, today I will discuss how the US-China uh, strategic competition has shaped the regional economic cooperation from the Chinese perspective, along with uh, the disruptions brought by the COVID pandemic. And I will also conclude with uh, some source on post-pandemic uh, economic cooperation in the region. So uh, if we look at the history of US-China strategic competition, I would argue that uh, 2008 is really a watershed year. Before 2008, the US largely welcomed China's participation in global economic governance as a new member of the WTO and encouraged China to play a bigger role in the multilateral trading system. But there's relationships really started to um, become uh, a crime, uh, a crime uh, after the WTO minister held in uh, July 2008 failed to revive the Doha round. So uh, at the time of the negotiations in July 2008, the US actually tried to salvage, run, uh, salvage the round by asking China to provide additional concessions on special products in agriculture and sectoral negotiations on industrial goods. But China declined because China argued that the same demands were not made to the other uh, big emerging powers like India or Brazil. So the US subsequently accused China of uh, uh, basically stalking the wrong and uh, um, uh, uh, preventing the wrong from concluding. And the Chinese ambassador gave a really uh, a long uh, diatribe uh, refuting the US government. So the initiative started to go source. Now, uh, another major event that happened in 2008 was the financial crisis. So if you look at what happened in the financial crisis, China basically was able to avoid the contagious effect from the global crisis by maintaining its uh, uh, restrictions on foreign exchange and capital flows. And this kind of bolstered China's confidence in the so-called Beijing model, a model of economic growth that relies heavily on government intervention. So uh, it's incomplete market reform, long regarded as an embarrassing failure, is now held by the Chinese government as a unique feature of the Chinese system. Moreover, we see emergence as the biggest exporter in 2009, despite global trade contraction by a certain percent, the Chinese leaders started to question the wisdom of more market oriented reforms and start to have more confidence in their own model. So uh, this resulted in uh, some strong reaction from the US. Uh, the US concerned with the rise of China 
decided to um, uh, announce the pivot to Asia. The state. Now, uh, even though the TPP uh, did not uh, implicate China uh, directly, but the attacks on China become more blunt after Trump became president in early 2017 when he pushed for decoupling with China, which later escalated into a bilateral trade war where most of the bilateral trade are subject to additional tariffs. So um, even with the signing of the phase one agreement two years ago, the bilateral trade initiative has never. So uh, if you look at this resulted, I would argue in fundamental. Oh, Professor Gao, I am so sorry. Regional economic integration, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I think you know, the, your voice is in breaking down. There were calls, yeah, just as I note. Now it's okay. Oh uh, yeah, the, the there are some moments you know we uh, were losing you, like a pause. Yeah, but the, yeah, it's okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, I guess too many people are <laughs> in these days. Yeah, uh, so thank you. So uh, anyway, uh, if you look at the regional integration in Asia Pacific, uh, they have traditionally been driven by the actors uh, within the region. So this started with uh, China's courtship of uh, ASEAN in 2000 uh, and the week of uh, the Asian financial crisis to launch the FTA negotiation, which was the first for both parties. So China's aggressive FTA strategy, as I was uh, reading about earlier, has resulted in a wave of uh, what I would call competitive regionalism among ASEAN's neighbors, as all of its external partners started to negotiate FTAs uh, with uh, uh, ASEAN. So when the US-China strategic competition heated up, the US also started to uh, realize the strategic value of the region, uh, which is reflected in this new pivot to Asia approach. Uh, and the centerpiece of this strategy is the TPP, which has been used by the US as a key instrument to rally uh, the allies in the region. In particular, I would argue that uh, uh, two features in the TPP are of a particular relevance to China. So the first one is the rules of origin rules. Now, uh, you find such rules in all FTAs, but what is different by, uh, about the uh, TPP is that it contains some of the strictest rules of origin in an effort to make sure that non-members like China will not free ride. One example is the notorious Yang forwarding rule, which states that for a final apparel product made in the TPP, it would be considered as originating only if such a fabrics are both formed and finished from yarn that is formed and finished in the territory of one or more uh, parties of the TPP. So essentially, this provision was put in place to make sure that China would not be able to piggyback on the provincial uh, access created uh, under the TPP by exporting the yarn to TPP members such as Vietnam. So basically, this is uh, a way by the US to try to uh, cut China out of the regional uh, supply chain. Second, the US also pushed for inclusion of rules on SOEs, uh, competition, and e-commerce. This was uh, answer Obama's call to make sure that it's the US and not countries like China that is uh, one writing the centrist rule for the world economy. Now, such rule really uh, kind of uh, up the game. Uh, to again borrow Obama's speak for regional economic cooperation by preempting the Chinese challenge and informing future discussions on these issues in other regional and global forums such as the WTO. So uh, what are China's reactions? If you look at what China has been doing, China, as you can see, its moves uh, are quite different from the US. Now, uh, China's moves, I would argue, compose of uh, two major components. The first one is rebuilding the supply chain interrupted by the US. So this is mainly done through the launch, uh, launch of negotiation on the RCP uh, in uh, response to the TPP uh, and also the uh, launch of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, uh, in the next year. 
So uh, basically, if you look at uh, both of these uh, initiatives, I mean, the uh, RCEP is basically uh, an attempt to rebuild the regional supply chain in the East and Southeast uh, Asia region. And the BRI is to rebuild the supply chain uh, in a wider region that is not just uh, Asia, but also Africa and Latin America. Uh, and uh, this allows China to build its own supply chain without direct confrontation with the US in the Pacific. The second move by China, uh, in contrast with the U.S. approach, which keeps introducing new and stricter rules, is that China adopts the contrary approach and lowers the bar for regional economic uh, integration. Now, uh, one example would be the uh, BRI. So if you look at the BRI, many of the countries, I would argue, in this initiative are low-income development countries or even LDCs which have difficulty meeting even the uh, normal rules under the WTO, but China adopts an open approach and doesn't prescribe any condition for participation in the BRI. And this is also reflected in the RCEP, where the rules are also diluted to ensure the maximum participation of all countries. For example, the check down e-commerce is subject to extensive exemptions and excluded from the dispute settlement chapter. And this is actually done at the request of not only China, but also some other members such as India. Similarly, China agreed to the removal of the investor state dispute settlement mechanism from the investment chapter, even though China really wanted to include this by submitting proposals on this, but because of the resistance of certain uh, ASEAN members and also non-ASEAN members like Australia and uh, New Zealand, China uh, also agreed uh, to keep it out. So uh, what are the effects on the COVID-19 pandemic? So the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, according to the WTO, has a broad and unprecedented disruption to the global economy and world trade. But what is interesting is that uh, the impact of the pandemic on the two largest economy in the world has been uneven with China ironically seeing its trade surplus jumping 30% in 2021 from the previous year uh, to set a new re record, while the US recording a 20% increase in its trade deficit rather than surplus to an all-time high of uh, about 860 billion US dollars. So what are the reasons for the differences? In my uh, 2018 article in the Journal of International Economic Law, Contrasting positions uh, to digital trade by the U.S. and China, I argue that uh, their different, uh, their differing approach to digital trade approach can be explained by the different natures of trade, with China focusing more on traditional trading rules and the U.S. mainly focusing on digital service trade. The same explanation, I would argue, also works here. If we look at COVID trade restrictions around the world, they tend to be mainly restrictions on the movement of person, while Chinese goods are largely kept free of restrictions. Therefore, naturally, it would affect more services-oriented economies like the U.S. rather than heavy good exporters like China. Going forward, however, I would argue that the policy choices made by the two countries, especially those on regional economic integration, will also have a bigger impact on their trade performance. On the one hand, the U.S. since the signing uh, of the uh, USMCA in November 2018, that is more than three years ago, has not negotiated any FTAs and currently doesn't have a plan to do so. And uh, the newly announced Indo-Pacific strategy doesn't look like, uh, you know, uh, something that will replace the TPP. But during the same time period, if you look at what China has been doing, they've signed FTAs with Mauritius and Cambodia, and uh, uh, they have uh, upgraded their FTAs with Chile, Singapore, ASEAN, Pakistan, and New Zealand. And they have concluded and launched the, the RCEP. And they have applied to join the TPP and even the DEPA. So uh, if you look at what the Biden administration has been doing, since they came into office a year ago, they have been busy promoting this worker center trade policy, which unfortunately lacks a substance. In review of the controversial nature of trade policy in U.S. domestic politics, I think it's a high and likely that the U.S. will be able to make major moves in the next two to three years because Biden would probably want a second term. Indeed, even the widely anticipated Indo-Pacific economic framework, as I mentioned, would probably end up as more hollow than the sun's at will, uh, just uh, focus on issues including digital trade supply chains, and green technology, basically everything uh, other than real trade. 
So given the well-known resistance to these issues by India, the biggest player in Indo-Pacific, I think the US plan might turn out to be more rhetoric, leaving countries in the region uh, to uh, uh, um, be subject to more uh, influence by the economic gravity force of China. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gao. Uh, now I'd like to uh, move on to our, our last speaker, Dr. Sanchita Bustas. Uh, she is an economist at Regional Cooperation and Integration Division under Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department of Asian Development Bank. Um, Dr. Urbas Das, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to our uh, RSIS and GRIPS for the invite in this interesting discourse. Uh, let me share my thoughts from ASEAN perspective. Uh, Shalu, can you please put up my slides, please? Uh, next slide, please. I have two very short slides, uh, but I will uh, give the explanation and give a concluding remarks. So uh, I will say like ASEAN as a region uh, wants all major economies to work with it. In the last two years, and I think uh, more currently, recovering from the effect of COVID-19 pandemic is a priority, and it will remain so in the foreseeable future. And for ASEAN, uh, I've been observing ASEAN since like 2002. And so since it has come up with the ASEAN Economic Community uh, Blueprint, ASEAN believes that all member countries and the countries with which it has the institutional partnership need to go for a well-designed cooperation measures rather than competition. And when I say well-designed cooperation measures, I'm not saying things are in like black and white. Sometimes it can be about networking, exchange of information, generating more um, awareness about certain policy reform, things like that, which needs to be done equally among the 10 member economies rather than go on for a direct uh, policy reform in the domestic economy. And so immediate uh, concern for during this COVID-19 or going forward is we will be the access to vaccine and efforts to mitigate the economic fallout from this uh, prolonged lockdowns and closures. And these will be the priorities of the ASEAN governments. So even if the major economies seem to set for certain kind of competition, the ASEAN countries will prioritize their own needs and make policy decisions based on their interest and perceived benefits. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the areas we are going to see greater cooperation? Uh, of course, uh, and I'm, I will be sharing only a couple of examples, but my view is going forward, ASEAN cooperation will be advanced in few areas, say uh, with, of course, trade and, uh, trade and investment will always be a priority or the core interest for the ASEAN countries. So one area where we can see greater integration going forward is the supply chain uh, supply chain uh, issue, or I will say like the cross-border trade facilitation measures. And this became uh, very important during the pandemic because uh, we saw major challenges in the early phase of pandemic, uh, primarily because of two reasons, uh, like countries are either part of the global value chain network or there is geographic concentration of production of goods. So, uh, so both these reasons uh, show that the importance of international trade uh, for this region. And these uh, and the countries face the supply chain disruption more because of the local lockdowns or the challenges in cross-border transport. Say so to give you an example for the GVC participation, like in the sectors, uh, electronics and textiles or apparels, they got disrupted due to lockdowns in PRC which affected the flows of parts and components in this region. Say about around 20, 40 to 60% of electronics components uh, for factories in Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam are sourced from the PRC. And again, around 55% of inputs for the April factories in Cambodia, Myanmar, and Vietnam comes from the same country. So looking for the geographic concentration, PRC is, was the largest supplier of face masks, medical goggles, and protective gowns to global economy in 2019. But they directed the same for its own use in 2020, and it lowered its export. 
So there was an immediate shortfall in importing countries, particularly when COVID case, in case cases were ri rising rapidly. Of course, there were export control, uh, controls for major ingredients or the final products. But as we progressed from 2020 to 2021, we saw many of those restrictions were either removed or lowered uh, over time. So in addition to these challenges, we also saw some issues with the transport and shipping during the lockdown and the, uh, and the, uh, and the, and the time when the countries were coming up with the social distancing protocols. And all of these caused delays and shortages of goods in the important countries. So I feel like ASEAN countries uh, will pay particular attention to uh, supply chain disruption and they will try to uh, expedite their uh, area of initiatives in initiatives in the trade facilitation measures. Uh, it has, of course, uh, set up the national and the regional single windows, and it is uh, greatly encouraging electronic submission of the trade related documents. And during COVID time, we saw that the countries expedited implementation of the simplified customs procedures. We also saw during the COVID-19 uh, uh, period or the, during the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic, the, K, the 10 countries decided to remove restriction on the intra-regional uh, trade for medicines, uh, at least for two years. I think it will end in this, this year, in 2022. Uh, and uh, they have removed tariff lines uh, for tariffs across 152 uh, essential medical goods that covers soaps, disinfectant, face mask, and many others. The other area of cooperation that may increase post-pandemic is the tourism sector. <clears throat> the sector was very important for ASEAN as it con uh, contributes around 15% of the region's GDP and around uh, same percentage in the total employment in the region. Uh, and uh, during COVID pandemic, what the region realized is the risk that the uh, sector faces uh, 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 from its like the regular trend and mainly the risk like the concentration of the source market majorly to Asia, predominance of air travel as a mode of transport and domestic travel is not adequate from the revenue perspective. So going forward, we will expect uh, ASEAN regional cooperation uh, in the tourism sector to focus on few areas like uh, the countries will feel uh, greater necessity to, uh, to uh, adoption of technology to track the tourist traffic in popular destination or increase cross-border information exchange over say vaccine or testing to safely promote tourism activities. Uh, it may also work to, uh, it may also it may also decide to work together in say data gathering and by this I mean, COVID-19 has brought to the fore the vulnerability of the entire value chain of the tourism industry and which spreads from domestic economy to the, uh, to the distribution net net network and the destination countries. So it made like uh, the role of data in the policy making has grown up uh, in, uh, in the ASEAN countries. The countries may also work for sustainable tourism. And by this, I mean that the governments may came up with uh, new tourism product or say policies to divert visitors from popular destinations to uh, more inclusive uh, outcome for say involving the local communities. Uh, so on my next slides and yeah. So in conclusion, what I will say that COVID-19 has increased the need for cooperation. ASEAN has realized uh, the importance of cooperation. They have worked with each other for very long, uh, much beyond to, to 2002. They have been working together with each other since the early 1990s, particularly for the economic cooperation. The countries know each other's uh, differences. And, and I think for the past two, three decades, they have learned to accommodate each other's requests to some, uh, uh, some extent. This may, of course, slow down ASEAN processes. And as we move towards more complicated topic like technology, uh, data flow, we will see the uh, ASEAN integration process slowing down further. Uh, but I think uh, being a follower of ASEAN for very long, I, I must say that I have learned to live with it. Uh, ASEAN will have deeper integration in few areas compared to others. I think I said that earlier also. And Trade and investment will be the core interest, while cooperation in digital areas to promote trade and investment will grow. 
So that's the advancement ASEAN will do from say 90s to 2000 to now. ASEAN will remain a neutral body that follows the consensus decision-making process. It doesn't want or it doesn't aspire to be part of the conflict among the major economies in the world. ASEAN realizes its strength uh, in economic integration, even though observers see risk of ASEAN members getting drawn to ideas of say US or the PRC, the members see its own benefit being engaged with both the economies. So now we have the RCEP, it's now, it's led by ASEAN and it is now effective. Few of the ASEAN members are also part of CPTPP and uh, this is again seen by many as something dividing ASEAN. Uh, but if I, uh, if I put my argument, I will say ASEAN members for long have decided that while some initiatives building on ASEAN economic community will be for all the 10 members, there are some members who are more advanced in terms of uh, in terms of their economies and they can go ahead and join uh, bilateral or other regional trade agreements. So what, we, what ASEAN may need at this juncture um, is uh, strong leadership to put forth the grouping strategic interest for being together, uh, handle intra-ASEAN differences by streamlining ASEAN documents, generating greater understanding of what the organization intends to do and why. And because regional integration itself is a, is a two-step process that the benefits from the regional integration will only result when countries undertake the domestic reform or harmonize regulations across border. So ASEAN countries need to come up the, uh, with this greater understanding of regional integration and while continuing to work with all the big economies. So I will stop there. Thank you. Over to you, Suyat.